September 2020. I'm walking to a gym at 11.30 p.m. to get some extra shots of randomly pass out. Boom, outside, dark, nobody to be found, but just me laying there. And I wake, I wake up, see an ambulance. I'm hearing my mom and dad on the phone, security guards all running. I see my coach's face, he has a long face. He's sad, it's almost like he's seen a ghost. Um, I'm like, what's wrong? Like, you know, like, tell me what happened. Like, you passed out, you don't know what happened. We're gonna get, the doctor's gonna check you up or whatever. Um, spent like two days in the hospital. Instead, I was going back and forth to Canada and the US, visiting doctors, trying to figure out what's going on with me. So they're saying, man, you might not be able to play basketball again unless you get this surgery, unless they do this, unless they do that. I'm like, man, I'm not trying to hear none of that. I need a second opinion, I need a third opinion, and I need a fourth opinion. All you guys are wrong. I'm not trying to hear none of that. What's up, y'all? My name is Elijah Lufile. Uh, today, I wanted to share my testimony with you guys uh, about my life journey, what I've been through, because I feel like it would ultimately help somebody who may be going through something that I went through. Uh, somebody might be going through certain things um, that I went through in the past. And by me sharing my testimony, how I've overcame, how I conquered those things in my life, when it seemed impossible, I think by me sharing this will bless somebody. So I want to talk about how I grew up. Um, I grew up in a Christian home. My father is a pastor um, and he's from the Democratic Republic of Congo, as well as my mom who served in the church. I played the piano and the drums in the church. And honestly, a lot of people say that, you know, they didn't really like going to church and stuff like that, or they were too tired. But ultimately for me, uh, I love playing instruments in the church. That's one of the reasons why I would wake up every Sunday because I was excited to go play the drums or play the piano or play the, the bongo uh, simply because I love uh, playing instruments and making music. Um, now for the preaching part, I was kind of tuned out a little bit. I was young, kind of distracted a little bit. Um, but when it came down to praise and worship, that was something that I was fully invested, fully invested in. I would practice with my mom probably like four days out of the week a lot, and I had fun with it, and uh, I was taking lessons, and that's just, that's just how it was for me growing up in the church. I'm the youngest of five, and I was the one child who was really invested in uh, my dad's church and, in his, and you know, building his ministry. Um, so like I said, yeah, I'm the youngest of five. Uh, I come from a family who plays basketball, plays sports, uh, and... I followed in my oldest brother's footsteps, um, Shadrach. He played basketball um, and was really good in high school, hit a hurly growth spurt. A lot of schools were after him. He had the, the most attention out of all of us. And that is something that, you know, my brothers won't share that a lot of us were kind of jealous of. We wanted that attention, but at the end of the day, we had a role model. We had somebody to look up to. We had somebody to look up to. And that uh, that is the reason why I'm a professional basketball player till this day. Uh, it's because of him, and I, I, I give him all the credit for that. Because if it wasn't because of him, by you know giving us that pathway, you know I probably wouldn't be uh, a professional basketball player. You know, um, in our household, it was pretty interesting because um, you know the neighborhood that we were living in it was very multi diverse. Coming from a, a neighborhood where there's a lot of you know people who are Muslim. Uh, Catholic or different religions and us as Christians was not crazy because we were young, but um, a lot of differences, a lot of differences in opinions and certain things. And um, we weren't really accustomed to a lot of people's, you know, faith and opinion. So, you know, my father received a lot of backlash simply because of who he was as a pastor, as a man of God, and our family, you know, and that kind of weighed down our family a little bit in our ministry. Uh, certain people had their opinions on our family, um, so that kind of hurt his ministry, that kind of hurt the, our family name a little bit, so it was kind of tough growing up as a pastor's kid. I mean, everyone knows who's a pastor's kid, you know how difficult it is, uh, the spotlight's on you, everything's like magnified. So that was kind of hard for me to uh, grow up and knowing people knowing that I'm a pastor's kid, oh, you shouldn't be going here. You shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be doing this. 
And that was kind of frustrating for me. So I always kind of felt like I was always in a shell. I always had to be in a shell and kind of be um, away from the world a little bit. Just not understanding the little things that I wanted to do as a kid and as a teenager, and but I couldn't do because I felt like, man, this may bring down my father's name. I might bring him shame, you know? But I got to a point in my life where um, I guess a lot of people will call it confidence, you know? I started to... I started to work out a little, more, little bit more. I started to get taller. I started to get a little bit more attention from females. I started to play sports. So I think popularity started to get the best of me. And as I started to go through middle school, uh, high school a little bit, I started to get better at basketball, you know? So, um, you know, like I said, growing up in the church, um, that was a really big, this still is a really big part of my life but that wasn't the focal point. God was not the focal point in my life. It was strictly sports, girls, maybe school, and just having a good time. That was my life. That's simply what it was. And that's what it was for majority of my brothers at that time. Like I said, I followed in their footsteps. And during that time, that's the direction that they were headed. So as a basketball player, um, when you get that attention, it feeds your ego. And one thing's for certain is that when, me personally, I can speak for myself, when my ego started to get fed, um, I wanted, I was exploring. I was exploring, I was, I was building curiosity, you know, especially about women, especially sexual desires and all these other things. And I kind of want to talk about those things that I, I, I really got sucked into that uh, sexual, immoral, thing that that had, like had me in captivity. So at a really young age, probably around 10 years old, uh, some of my friends, we would, uh, we would be on the computer, we would look at naked images of females, kid stuff that was very immature. But like I said, curiosity. Um, and it was one simple thing that just would allow our mind to just explore and think and curiosity would build up just by a TV show we'd watch, by the song we would uh, listen to, lyrics and all these other things. And your mind is just oh, just going crazy. And I truly believe that that was an open door, right? That was an open door. Those images, those videos, those video webcam live um, websites that they have where people can interact with each other and just a whole bunch of just inappropriate things that a child should not be looking at. I was involved with these things, right? And... Um, when this happened, it, that desire even grew even stronger and stronger and stronger. Like I said, I was the age of 10 and then I fell into pornography, right? So you have someone who grew up in the church, who's playing instruments in the church and who's worshiping God, who's singing, who's praying at home with their parents and doing all these other things and like acting like a true pastor's kid, but I'm watching pornography I'm almost every night, if not that, um, and I'm speaking. I have a lot of profanities coming out of my mouth. I'm listening to secular music. Um, I'm doing all these things that the Bible tells you not to do. So I'm living this double life, and uh, the Bible will say lukewarm. And uh, because I'm trying to play both ends of the field. I'm in the church, I'm serving, I'm doing this and that, whatever. And then when I feel like it, that's when I'll preach the gospel at the same time. When the doors are closed and nobody's watching, I'm committing sin, probably every sin in the book. I'm doing all these other things. And I can honestly say that had me, that had me in a chokehold for a good like 10, 10 to 12 years, maybe even longer, maybe 13 years. I could not let go of that. That I could not um, remove myself from that leash of being just uh, attached and addicted to pornography. That's just what it was. It was, a, it was a desire. And whenever I felt down, whenever I felt like I wasn't myself, whenever I felt disappointed in myself, whenever somebody would say certain things to me, you're not this, you're nobody, or a girl would break my heart, that was the only way that was going to give me a temporary gratification. Pornography. You know, as, as, as men, this, like... You, is talking to the men out there, you know how that feels for that moment when, when, you, when you open up that laptop or your phone and you're looking at these videos and you want to have that feeling that's going to make you feel good. But 
at the end, it actually makes you feel worse because you know you shouldn't be doing this. You know what's wrong and you know it does not solve the problem. So when I continue to fall into this, uh, there was days where I said, you know what? I'm enough, enough, enough. And then a week or two will go by and I fall back into it, feel even worse, feel even worse. And um, that was my life. It was like a cycle. It was like, I would tell myself, I'm not going to give into this. I'm a pastor's kid. I grew up in the church. I know the word of God. I pray. There's no way I'm going to let the devil just play with my mind like this. And I'm going to keep doing these things. There's no way. But one thing's for certain, many people, even Christians till this day, they underestimate how smart Satan is, right? You can say that you hate the devil. You can say, oh, no, I'm a child of God. I have the armor of God. I know the word of God. No weapon formed, et etc., cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But don't be fooled. Do not be fooled, right? He knows our weaknesses. The scripture says that God is, he's made strong in our weaknesses. But the problem for me was that I did not allow God to be my strength. I didn't allow myself for God to be my foundation. I didn't allow that to happen. I, there's a difference between knowing the word of God and living according to the word of God. There's a complete difference and I wasn't doing that. And that's probably why I fell into that cycle um, that held me captivity for, you know, 10 plus years. So now to get a little even more deeper into that, so pornography and then losing my virginity and obviously outside of marriage, which was very uncomfortable for me because I was really young. I was really young. And at the time, I didn't know what happened. I didn't know what just I knew what happened, but at the same time, it was like, whoa, like, okay, this is what it was. All right. I didn't, this is how it's supposed to feel. Um, I'm ashamed at the same time. No one knows. I, I, I said, I'm telling myself, okay, you know, I'm going to, like, I'm just going to take this to the grave. There's no way. I'm not like, if I tell my parents this, how would they think of me? Like, I don't even, I don't even know if my brothers had lost virginity at the time. Like, I don't know that at the time that I lost my virginity, at the time that I exposed myself to sexual activity, I didn't know if my siblings would do it because I didn't see them do it, doing it. It just felt like, I just felt disappointed in myself. I felt like God didn't really like me or didn't love me uh, because I kept on disappointing him. I kept on sinning against my body. Um, even though he created me in the, in the likeness of his own image, I'm like, what am I doing to myself? But like I said, it, it did feel good. All these things that I was doing, it did feel good as a young child, teenager, what have you. And when I got to that, my later teenage years, um, now I'm feeling into my body. I'm getting a little bit muscle. Women are paying attention to me. It's feeding my ego. So now me having sex is a regular thing. Me having sex is a regular thing with females that I don't even know. I'm opening doors, um, soul ties. Now I become emotionally connected to these females and I really don't even care for them. But there's an attachment that I've built. Um, and at the time, I'm not understanding why my life's going the way it is. My mind, I feel like my mind was playing tricks on me. Why was I being depressed at the age of 17 and 16? I'm just a kid. Why am I going through heartbreaks? Why am I going through all these other things? I don't understand. Like, why am I feeling like this? And then it gets even worse, right? There's times where I try to pull myself out of it, but the thing is, you're not supposed to pull yourself out of it. It's not, it's not our job to pull ourselves out of it. The Bible says to call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. Probably didn't do that uh, enough times. So as I continue to fall into that trap, into that pit of sexual immorality, as the youngest of five, um, you're the baby of the family. My mom pampered me, she babied me, she gave me everything I ever wanted, you know. I was, my oldest brothers, they, they got to go out to the, the carnivals and the festivals and stay out late, but I had to stay at home with mom and dad or whatever. But the moment I got a sense of freedom to go to the U.S. where I got a basketball scholarship away from my family for the first time, it was the most dangerous thing that has ever happened to me, becoming an adult. And so the age of 18, 19, it was the most dangerous thing that happened to me because um, I knew where I was and I, I knew that 
I was at the height of my desire, desire, the fleshy desires. I got to go to, I got to go away from home. I got to meet all these women. I got to play basketball. I got a scholarship. My parents don't have to pay for school. And like when I do certain things, my dad's not going to ask me what time are you coming home? Where are you at? What are you doing? Can't ask me that. All those things are going through my mind. I'm like, yes, like I get to do all these other things. Instead of focusing on school and focusing on basketball and building my relationship with God and, you know, meeting new people and, and building relationships and doing things the right way, I was focusing on feeding my flesh, making myself feel good. And it didn't matter what was going on. As long as I felt that way, as long as I got that attention, as long as girls were telling me, you're cute, as long as girls were ha- like sending me Snapchats and the photos that I wanted to see, I was like, I'm good. Like, I have it. Like, they're, they're on me right now. Like, you can't tell me nothing. I'm on the top of the world. I wasn't. I was fooling myself. I allowed the devil to play tricks, to play tricks with my mind. And that thing started to grow even more, even, even more, even more. And um, it just, like I said, a continuous cycle in college, um, breaking other women's hearts when they didn't deserve it. Um, just, you know, feeding them false, false, empty promises saying, yeah, I love you. I care for you. I want to be with you. I want to I want to build something with you. Yeah, I'm talking to 10 other females. I'm just feeding myself and feeding my ego and I'm, I'm breaking hearts. I'm, 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 I'm building soul ties and it's just, and I'm just leaving this crumbs left behind, you know, with, with just me and heartbreak and so much more and all these things that I'm leaving behind. And it's just like, man, like it was overwhelming at times. I knew I shouldn't have been doing it. It's like the thing about the Holy Spirit, when you know the word of God, it tugs at you. It's like, it tugs at you. It's like someone tugging at your shirt. Hey, like, relax. You shouldn't be doing this. Chill. Like, what are you doing? You're wilding right now. Like, chill. But that fleshy desire was too strong. That's that, that's, it's the one thing the Bible tells. It says literally run from sexual sin. Literally run. Like, if you could picture somebody running away from, I don't know, like, you see the word sexual immorality, someone running away, that's literally what the Bible is telling you, run away from it. Because it could do so much damage to your life. And it's one of the things that can also affect your future. And a lot of people can argue and say, oh, no, you this, these things happen because you dealt with this and this. But honestly, when, when you disobey God, certain things happen. You have to deal with the consequences consequences we serve a forgiving god a loving god but what makes him even more i guess of lordship authoritative and and king of all and just is his his discipline that's just what makes him more i guess more like a lord god that we serve like you know our our majesty and everything is because of his discipline he disciplines us like like a father disciplines his child, as it says in the book of Hebrews. So those are the things I started to experience. And it was in a unique way, humbling way, just learning, like, just just not even learning, just certain things that happened in my life that didn't make sense. I'm like, I'm gonna get to it. So when I get to college, now I'm living, I'm living in sin or whatever. Next thing you know, 20, I think it was 20, 2018. I think it was 2017. Um, I think it was in November, so close to my birthday. My ber- birthday is November 7th. My mom gets diagnosed with cancer. So I'm like, oh, like, what's going on here? Then, next thing you know, I get diagnosed with cardiomyopathy. So that is a, a diagnosis for athletes who have a heart condition where they could easily pass out and die. There's been, been many people, many athletes who have running in the middle of a game and they just passed out, heart stop, boom. So like, oh, you have this. I'm like, there's no way. This is not even, it's not hereditary. Nobody in my family deals with this. How do I even have this? You're telling me that I, me, I have this when I've been playing sports since the age of five and I just all of a sudden get these things. A lot of people can say then again, oh, you know, when you're bigger and your, 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 your organs are a lot bigger and all these other things. I'm like, okay, cool. But like, there's no way, like, there's no way. So I missed that whole year. I had the red shirt. If anybody doesn't know what that red shirt means, is that you 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 uh you continue to go to school, but you don't play that year. You don't play that sport. So you wretched you you still keep your eligibility. That's what it means. 
And so I did that same thing, kept my eligibility. So I played. Now I'm, now I'm going through this heart issue and I'm still living in sin. Imagine. Like you would think somebody would be like, okay, you know what? I need to go in my prayer closet and I need to pray and get my life together. No, I just, I, I was drinking. I was going to the club. I was, I was living the life as if I was the starting star player on the team. And in fact, I, like, my name wasn't even on the roster. Right? If my dreams, like, I felt like my dreams were shattered. And that's probably the coping mechanism, maybe. But I was already deep in it. So it was like, I might as well. Like, I'm not even going to play. I got to get something out of this. That was my mindset. I got to get something out of this. Like, there's no way I'm about to come to this school and just not hoop. There's no way. So that following summer comes. And I, and I, I go to the doctors. And I get all these tests. I'm like, I need a second opinion. I'm eating healthy. Now I'm back to praying. Funny enough, when I go home under my father's roof, who's a pastor, now I want to start praying because he prays at home. And it, that the, the house is filled with so much anointing that I'm like, yo, you know what? I need to get back into prayer mode. I need to do all this. I need to fast. So God comes through. I get cleared. Praise God. God, you did it again. Like, oh, I'm so grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Now I can actually live on my dreams to be a professional basketball player and make it to a division one uh, school. And like, I can, I can play basketball again. Like, okay, I'm good. I'm back. There was a word that came to my father and he said, listen, God has given you another opportunity. Don't mess it up. Don't mess it up. Be clean. Stay away from women. Stay away from these things that would lead you down a dark path. Yeah, dad, I got you. Like, okay, I promise. Of course. Like, that's my response. I get to another school. I'm in Texas now. And it's more kind of the South. And um, it was just a different, it was way different than where I was in Denver. It was just way different. The women there, the attention there, basketball is way, basketball and football is way bigger in Texas. So I'm getting more attention. Man, I totally forgot about what my dad told me. Women again, I fell into sin. And, I, and, I, and, and just all these things were happening. All these things were happening. Like I was just falling into sin. I was having sex. I was listening to secular music. I was going to clubs. It's funny because I was doing all these things, but I felt uncomfortable. It doesn't make sense. I felt uncomfortable doing these things, but I was still doing it. Like I said earlier, like the, 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 let's think about the Holy Spirit. When God speaks to you and you know that he's speaking to you, it's tugging at you, but you're resisting. You're resisting and you're resisting. No, I need to feed my flesh. No, I don't want my friends to think that I'm corny and that I'm a lame dude or I don't want the girls to think that I'm this church boy and I pray all the time and they're not going to be cool with me. They're not going to want to have me around. Like, that was my mindset. So, um, I played my that year and I did well. I did well for myself. We didn't have a really good winning record. Then I get a Division One scholarship. I'm like, Hold on, I did all these things. I still lived in sin and I still made it to a different one, division one school. I'm like, okay, hold on. Maybe okay, I, I need God in my life, but like I what I, I think what I did, I don't think I'm cool. Like I think I'm like I'm cool what I did. Like I'm I'm good. I'm good. Um I get to my school, division one school, so university, and you know, my dad gives me another word. Stay away from women. Just don't, just be single. Word for word. He said, be single. Elijah, I want you to be single. Say nothing but like two months, I got in a relationship. <laughs> two, I'm, I'm serious. Two months, I got a relationship. And I laugh about it now because it's like I literally disregarded everything my father said. And that's what we do all the time. We disregard what God says every single day. Since the beginning of time, we disregard God. Get in a relationship and it started off nice, started off wholesome, pure, usually how it goes, but the flesh is weak. At some point in time, you are going to have fleshy desires. You're going to look at that woman who you're with 24 seven. And if you're not strong in your word, if you're not ready to be in a relationship, or like the Bible says, look for a wife, then you're just going to fall in sin naturally. Um, and I'm thinking of things. I'm thinking of doing stuff with this woman. I'm thinking all this stuff is going through my mind. Like, I'm like, I don't know how long I can do this with like this relationship without getting something out of this, without actually 
uh, having sex with this woman. And it happened, and that's when everything went downhill again. 2020, um, I returned back to my sophomore year. The previous year, I had a decent year at my new Division I university. Got hurt at the end of a little bit, my foot, but I still played the full year. I had the full college experience. I'm like, I'm about to come back, have a great season. I'm going to get stronger, faster. My IQ is a lot better. We have a great team. So COVID, 2020, so I can't, I, I worked out in COVID. Like, I'm in the best shape as possible. Like, I mean, man, I know some of you guys saw it on Instagram. I was posting with my brother during COVID. We were in the gym. Like, I'm strong. My coach told me, this is the best shape I've ever seen you in. I'm like, yeah, like, I'm ready, coach. Like, I'm ready to, like, take over. Like, I want, this is going to be the year. September 2020, I'm walking to a gym at 11.30 p.m. to get some extra shots up. Randomly pass out. Boom, outside, dark, nobody to be found, but just me laying there. And I wake, I wake up, see an ambulance. I'm hearing my mom and dad on the phone. Um, security guards all running, talking. And it just, I don't know what's going on. It's just like, I'm there, but I'm not there. Like, I don't know what's going on. Like, I passed up and I'm in the hospital. <sighs> I see my coach's face. He has a long face. He's sad. It's almost like he's seen a ghost. Um, I'm like, what's wrong? Like, you know, like, tell me what happened. Like, you passed out. We don't know what happened. We're going to get, the doctor's going to check you up and whatever. Um, spent, like, two days in the hospital. Oh, man, I had a great support. I had family and friends check up on me, call me and everything. But during that time, I was so lost and confused because I'm like, man, I ate so healthy this summer. I did everything I possibly could to be in the best shape possible. Like, there's no way. Like, why is this happening? Don't worry. Like, this can't be happening right now. Like, no way. So I'm like, okay, maybe this is going to blow over. And then I'm going to, okay, they're going to say, okay, no, it's just an episode. He was dehydrated or whatever the case may be. No. The same thing that happened to me in 2017, cardiomyopathy, the whole heart situation. It happened again. So all of a sudden, I have a heart situation. Then I get cleared. And then I have it again. So... I had to redshirt that year again. That's how God humbles you sometimes. My team ended up going to the Sweet 16. I didn't play. Um, for those of you who don't watch basketball, Sweet 16 is a round in a, a college basketball tournament called the March Madness. It's during March. And it's, uh, I don't want to say it's worldwide, worldwidely watched, but it's watched throughout, you know, America and Canada. Um, one of the biggest events that happens in college uh, sports. I could have had a chance to play on national television for the first time in my life. But I didn't. Instead, I was going back and forth to Canada and the U.S., visiting doctors, trying to figure out what's going on with me. So then I'm saying, yeah, you might not be able to play basketball again unless you get this surgery Unless they do this, unless they do that. I'm like, man, I'm not trying to hear none of that. I need a second opinion. I need a third opinion. And I need a fourth opinion. All you guys are wrong. I'm not trying to hear none of that. The thing about college basketball and the whole institution, uh, whatever they say goes. You have no control over that. It's either you get the surgery or you don't play. Um, so the year goes by, I don't play. And honestly, I'm not going to say I'm at my highest like at this, I was pretty depressed. This wasn't the most depressed I've been, but I was depressed. Oh, my friends, my teammates, they were they were going on these trips playing basketball. And like I said, the sexual immorality had me in captivity. Even though I was going through this, the only thing that was gonna make me feel good was to watch porn, have sex, fall into sin, drink, and just live wild. But to act like I wasn't living wild. But behind closed doors, I was definitely doing them because I knew that I had an image to protect. My last name, who my father is, school I go to, predominantly Christian school, no, predom uh, 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 predominantly white school, a Christian school. Like, you gotta, you gotta pick and choose your battles. But I could do this behind closed doors and I could do this just to make my, just to make my heart feel like, make me feel good and make me feel like, okay, 
you know, something, make me feel something because I felt empty. I felt like my whole world was crashing down. I felt like I lost everything. I felt like a nobody. I felt like I didn't have a purpose. So that's what I was doing. So going through depression and also going through a lot of relationship issues man, the heartbreaks um, and the mistakes that I made, obviously not being ready for a relationship and being tempted from many directions, like wasn't always loyal or faithful. I made a lot of bad mistakes. I broke a lot of females' hearts. I've, I've done all these things and, you know, open about it. But it was like, it was like karma. Like it, it, it came right back around and bit me. And I, I was, I was, I was going through, it was so much toxicity. Like I didn't like it at all. So I found myself back in that prayer closet, back in that prayer closet. I'm like, God, like I'm tired. I would cry at night. I would cry at night so much, so much crying, so much tears, so much hurt, so much disappointment in myself, so much anger, so much emotion that I couldn't control. So I would lash out and get angry, blame somebody, blame this, blame that. But it was, it was, it was literally, it was, it was just me. Like I just, God was waiting for me. Like, listen, I'm waiting. Like, I'm waiting for you to call me. I'm waiting for you to give me a chance. God, allow me to take control. Let me take the wheel. I didn't want, I didn't want God to take the wheel. I kind of wanted, I kind of wanted him to be in the passenger seat just to be like, okay, just in case, you know, something goes wrong, like just be there. But that's, we serve a sovereign God, but that's not how it goes. That's just not how it goes. <sighs> Bible says all things work out good for those who love God. And in that time, I can't say that I truly loved God because I was not living according to his will. I didn't love his commandments. I didn't love everything that came with serving him and having him in my life. I can't say that I, I can't say that I loved. I can't say that. Honestly. So during that time, didn't play. I'm depressed. I'm sad. My mom's still going through cancer. Like I'm going through these things and I'm calling home. Oh, your mom, she just came back from this appointment. Yeah, it's not looking too good. I'm like, all right, click. Like, so then I'm like, so I don't even know who to worry about. Do I worry about myself? Do I worry about my father who has to like provide for her and everybody else who's living at home? What like what am I really doing right now? And like it, it was it was hard. It was hard. Like one thing I don't talk about a lot is like I don't go into detail about stuff with my mom a lot because it gets emotional. But like this is the reason why I'm doing this testimony because I, I, I want to. I'm, I'm trying to show you guys like listen. The Bible says we are more than conquerors. We can overcome anything, especially when you have God in your life. And I never thought that I would overcome this because it's my mom. You know, I never thought I would overcome it. <laughs> you know, during that time that she's going through cancer, it's tough for me. So I go home and I'm visiting her. I'm like, mom, this is, I'm with mom and I'm hanging out with her. And, I'm, you know, it's just, it's amazing to see her. Like, she's going through cancer, but she's, she's still, like, making me food. And she'll wake me up in the morning making me breakfast, like still singing and praying, still being that servant that like, I remember growing up in the church playing the instruments with. She's still doing the same thing as if she's not sick. So what kind of woman is this that she has strength like this? Like, and I'm complaining about, like, I don't even, her faith, like, you know, it just didn't make any sense. Like, I was complaining about my situation, but she had a terminal illness. The doctor never said I was going to die. Say, hey, look, listen, this is where your career is headed. This is what's going on. You don't have to, you get, no. But they told her, you have a terminal illness. We don't know how long it's going to be. And then boom, we're just going to give you treatment, go through chemo, all that stuff. But she comes back serving her husband, serving God, making sure her children are, her children are, are in good spirits, praying for them. 5 a.m. leading a prayer conference. Like, <laughs> I mean... Like, I don't, I don't know. Like, who am I, right? So the next year, 
I'm like, okay, I'm going to get the surgery. So a defibrillator is what they put in my left side of my body. Um, right here, I don't know if the camera can see it. This is a defibrillator. Put it in the left side of my body. And then that allowed me to be cleared in play. It took, they said, 12 weeks, don't do nothing. Just get back in shape. And it took time. I was overweight. It was bad. I didn't feel like myself. But I'm like, okay, like, if this is going to allow me to play, I think I skipped the moment. But right before that, I almost quit playing basketball for the rest of my life. I remember it was 2021. And um, my mother had just passed. May 14th, she passed away. And that was the hardest day of my life. Because I was home and they they called us. I remember they called us. They called us. They called my dad in the morning. In the afternoon. I remember I was taking a nap and my dad's like, yo, we gotta go to the hospital. I'm like, is everything okay? Uh, I was like, it's your mother. They're saying everybody come to the hospital. So we go there, and then she's still alive, life support, you know, she's hospice care. So like this is this is how I've been seeing her ever since I graduated, right? So like you know, graduated May first, and then I flew down May seventh, and then I, I went to the hospital. And I saw her; she's same condition. Like you know, she's laying there. I'm like hoping and I'm praying that okay, maybe she's gonna open her eyes one day. She's gonna be moving. She'll maybe move her hand. But I remember I would look at her hand. I would feel her hand. Like nothing is moving, but she's breathing. Mom, like you know, like say something. Like I'm here. I'm finally here. It's been months. Like say something. I'm here. You would think that you would walk in the room and she would feel your presence, like your mom. Like, okay, she knows my, she knows her son is here, like her baby is here. And I walk in, I'm thinking, nothing, no movement, just nothing, not even a, not even a head nod, not even a, not nothing. So she's just standing there or laying there. My aunt's right there, my brother's right there. Let me tell you something about my oldest brother. He quit basketball just to take care of my mom that whole entire time. And the way she was looking was very graphic. She's a heavy set woman and she lost so much weight from this cancer, this disease that destroyed her. It hit her liver, it hit her kidney, um, so many things. She dealt with COVID, all these things, they hit her all at once. And my brother, he held it down. He read a lot of books. He, he helped her with her nutrition. He, man, he held it down at the house. My, bro my brother got COVID. Uh, my older brother, Abednego, got COVID. Then my father gets COVID. Then my sister, nah, then everybody else gets sick. But he held it down. I don't know how he did it because I, I would have lost my mind. I would have been out of control, especially he's raising a son. I, I, I don't know how he did it, but I mean, I guess it was, I guess he was the right, right person for it. So, you know, I'm, I'm seeing my mom and my dad's in the hospital as well. Oh my God, like this is insane, God. You got both my parents here in the same hospital and I'm, I just graduated. Like I'm supposed to be, but like I'm coming back to, to it's scary over here. So my dad gets released from the hospital. So I start taking care of him. I'm like, so me and my brother, we work like a team. Okay, you take care of mom over here. I take care of dad over here. And we're just, okay, we're working as a team. I'm thinking like, I'm praying hard. Like th at this time, I'm not living in sin at this time. I'm praying hard. I'm going through a lot of toxic stuff with the relationship. But I put that aside. I'm like, this is my parents. Their life is in jeopardy right now. I'm like, I need to focus. I need to lock in. So I'm praying with my brother every night, praying with my dad. I see my dad laying on the floor. He just got out of the hospital. He's laying on the floor with his knee, with his hands up on his knees, crying to crying to God, just fresh out the hospital. God have mercy, praying for his wife, praying like this. He's on his knees, like praying. And I'm like, I'm looking like, I don't know what to say. Cause I'm like, do I say, yo dad, get up off the floor. Like, relax, like, you know, like, you know, like, or I don't know what to say. Like, I'm just there. Like I'm, I'm, I'm just there. It's a lot to process. To this day, like, I don't even know. Like, it's kind of hard to process to this day. So, seven days later, they call us. And then we get to the hospital. We're praying. We're singing. Praying. Praying. You know, you come from an African household. Like, you're, the, the prayers are different. You're speaking in tongues. You're praying. You're singing worship music. And it's like, okay, something, something's going to break. The Holy Spirit's going to move. But we know because we... Doctor comes in. is like, hey, listen. 
There's nothing else that we could do. She has to go. I'm like, listen, I'm not trying to hear none of this. So I just turn away, act like I didn't hear none of it. My brother's there. My dad's there. What can we do? My dad's like, yo, what can we do? Like, what do we need to do? Like, what for not that for that not to happen? What do we need to do? And then she pulled my dad to the side and she starts talking to him. I'm, I'm not, I can't hear what she's saying, but I just know from the tone of her voice that it's not good. So all I know is that the doctor walks over to my mom and something happens, you know, you know, you know, with, with somebody in that condition, you have to take uh, drastic measures. Um, we started to see, uh, I guess, those pulse numbers go down dramatically. And I'm like, yo, those numbers keep going down, and down, down. I'm like, it's, it's a wrap. It's over. Like, it's done. Like, we, like, everything that we prayed about, I'm angry at God. I'm like, there's no way. I'm here with my family. Like, everyone, I'm here. Like, it's me, my dad, my brother. We're looking at her dying in front of us. And that last breath that was taken, the whole room shifted upside down. And she was gone. And we started thinking about, you know, all the times, like, I could have done this. I could have treated her better. I could have maybe, maybe I should have said yes when she asked me to do the dishes. Maybe I should have said yes when she asked me to take her to the market. Maybe I should have came home. Maybe I should have quit. I maybe, I should, maybe if I did, if I did, that, I was like, all these thoughts came to my mind. I was so angry at God. So angry. I said, God, you, like, for real, really, like, Took my mom. I don't know. So, you know, I was angry. And then right back to living in sin. Two, two weeks later after the funeral, book of the flight to Vegas. My, 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 my friends playing in the NBA Summer League. I'm going to get my mind off things. I'm going to Vegas. I'm going to turn up. I'm going to get my mind off this. I don't want to. I don't want to have to do nothing with prayer. I don't, I don't want, I don't want, I don't want nothing. I don't want nothing to do with God right now. I don't. I just lost my mom. Like, can't, nobody can tell me anything at this point. Like, I, I nothing. I'm living, I'm, I'm living, in, I'm in Vegas. I'm, anybody who's been in Vegas, it's not a place for somebody to really just, a man of God to go and, and to have a good time. It, there's so much promiscuity there. There's so much women. There's so much. Sin. They call it Sin City for a reason. I went there to have a good time. And uh, I regretted it. And I come back and I have to have heart surgery. I have the heart surgery. I do nothing for 12 weeks. I'm out of shape. I almost quit. My dad's like, pray on it. I'm okay, I'm going to pray on it. So then I ended up playing, getting the surgery. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to quit. Because I had to weigh out the pros and cons. If I quit, I'm going to lose my scholarship. I won't graduate. My dad's not going to be able to afford my college. I don't have a job. I don't have money in my account. So I'm like, let me just do this. Let me just finish this out. So I, I ended up going. And um, and I'm like, I'm playing. Playing little minutes because I'm out of shape. Coach is still worried about my mental. You just lost your mom. We don't want you affecting the team. He didn't say this, but you know, I know how things go. I know the discussions behind closed doors. Like, let's make sure... Elijah's mentally prepared for this, but I was hungry. I said, I'm going to do this for my mom. I know she would not want me to quit and be like, you know. So I lost the weight. I worked hard. I went from playing three minutes, zero to three minutes to starting in the second half of the season. Playing like 25 plus minutes a game. I'm getting double doubles. So that means I'm getting double figure uh, numbers in different categories. Rebounds, points, that's my thing. But still wasn't enough. I was still empty. I, my heart was ripped apart. I was still angry at God. Still angry. But also going through a, like relationship issues. Like it, 
these are the things that, like, they go back to. Like, I disregarded everything that my father told me. So your sin will follow you. Consequences and repercussions for all these things. And I just, there was a lot of baggage. There was a lot of baggage. Like, it was like, if somebody were to open my heart, and you would just see a whole bunch of, you would just see damaged, hurt, angry, uh, frustrated, um, rage in me. Just, you would see that. You would see that. Um, I think when I lost my mom, I think I developed a, a crazy anger, temp, like anger, anger issue. Temper was quick. There was one specific game that I got in a fight and it was on national television. Till this day, it's still on YouTube. It has 1.4 view, mil, mil, uh, 1.4 million views. And I'm like, I, I, um, I cringe every time I, every time I see that video. And I'm looking at myself when I see that video, I'm like, like that person was hurt. That person was destroyed. That person just lost his mother. That's why he acted like that. That's why he was angry. He couldn't control himself. It wasn't because someone threw a sucker punch at him. He was angry. He lost his mom. He went through all of these things. He just wanted to take it out on somebody. Nobody got hurt, but there was just different moments in my life where I, I lost control of, I lost, con I, I, I had no self-control. I had no self-respect for myself. I was deep in sin, sexual immorality. Now anger, and I'm, 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 I'm insulting people. Uh, now I'm breaking hearts. Now it's, it turns into hurt people, hurt people. Now I'm hurting, I, because I'm hurting, I want to hurt somebody else. All these things were happening. I thought that this was going to be the rest of my life. I got to a point of surrender, I surrendered to God. I said, I, I'm done. I can't do this no more by myself. I started to go to church. Um, I started to go to this men's group on a Tuesday in Tulsa. Um, I started to go there and it was, I had to open up to these people. It was very uncomfortable. I had to share certain things. And I, I, I started to, it started to help me. It started to help me. I started to speak to these people. I talked to them about my mom. I talked about stuff that I was dealing with when I was younger, the things that I've been exposed to. And it just helped. And, I, and, and eventually I ended up confessing my sins to God. Eventually I ended up crying to God and, and praying and seeking God's face. Eventually I was able to help other people because there were some people going through the same thing that I went through. And I started to see how much of an impact it had in their lives. Like Elijah, like just how did you go through this? And you were able to, oh, brother, I don't know. It wasn't me. You think it was me that, that I lost my mother and I got hit with two diagnoses and I had a heart issue and I collapsed and supposedly almost died. Who knows what happened? You think that was because of me? No. I know, even though when I was living in sin, I know what the word of God says, a God that would never forsake me. And he was always holding my head that whole entire time. Even though I had to bury my mom, watch her die, go through heart issues, see my college career, my future, my, my dream almost shattered before my eyes. Me fall into sin, me living a life that was like, it had no value, had no purpose. All these other things that I was, God still had a plan for me. And, and, he, and it says in the book of Jeremiah, it says like, I knew you before your mother's womb. So he knew certain things that I was going to go through. Like it just, he knew everything. I, I, my mind can't even fathom it. But, and then. 29, Jeremiah 29 says, like, I have a plan and a purpose for you. I have to prosper you and give you hope in a future, not to harm you. So all those times when I thought that, oh, man, God, you, you, you harmed me, like, you hurt me. I went through all these things, like, whatever, but it was because of, it was because of his word. It's because I allowed myself to surrender to him and give him a chance that he set me free, that he delivered me from pornography. It's been two years. It's been two years since I've stepped into that, like, field of sexual immorality and pornography and all these other things. Two years. From where I came from, that's a miracle. Like, so, I share this testimony today to, sh like, 
uh, because I want to, I want somebody to be impacted by this because you know that God's never going to leave you. He'll never forsaken you. If you just give him a chance, if you just call upon his name, you just open his word, man, talk to somebody, confess your sins, release it. There's no point of holding it in and, and, and suppressing all these other things. That's how the, de- that's how the enemy can destroy you. He'll use your hurts. He'll use your weakness and he'll twist it. He's a deceiver. He's a liar, con artist. Don't fall into that trap like I did. But lucky for me, I got out because I made the decision to surrender, to let God take the wheel. Don't be that person where you are going to regret it. I should have did this. I should have listened. I should have. I should have. Don't be that person, especially living in sin. I may be talking to believers and non-believers, but at the end of the day, we are all creators. We are all created in God's own image. And he had a purpose for each and every one of us. But he also had commands and there's guidelines in which you must follow if you want to inherit the kingdom of God. Obeying his commandments. Living according to his will. It's serious out here. It's real. What I went through was real. Many of you are going through the same thing, if not but worse. This is a little part of my story. It gets a lot more crazier. But it even gets better because you'll see, I've seen so much of the glory of God be manifested in my life. I, there's certain things I don't deserve. There's certain position I don't deserve to be in life. But God gave me a chance. This is the purpose. This is where I wanted you to be. But you just, I needed you to surrender. I needed you to allow me to work and to do everything that I'm supposed to do. And when I did that today, I'm a professional basketball player. I played in the NBA G League. I played in the CBL in Canada, I played overseas. I'm able to make money by the grace of God. I'm getting married. That is by the grace of God. And the last testimony is that I met my fiance at my mother's funeral. I met my mother, my, my fiance at my mother's funeral. And in 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 um and I'm paraphrasing, I think there's a scripture about it. It's you know, whenever like there's always a blessing that comes out of I guess a bad thing or a curse, a blessing that comes out of something, right? I'm paraphrasing. And that, and that she's my greatest blessing till this day because she's a woman of God who prays for me and has seen all the hardships that I went through, seen the good and the bad and the flaws and still looked at me and, still, and saw me as God's child. So I hope this testimony will help anybody who's going through heartbreak, who's dealing with sexual immorality, pornography, knowing that there's a way out. There is only one way out. There is only one way out. His name is Jesus Christ. There's only one way out. His name is Jesus Christ. We serve a God that would never lie. It's one of the words that he repeats probably a million times in the Bible. He will never forsake you. You'll pass through the waters and you'll pass through the rivers. Even pass through the go through the fire, but you'll never be burnt. You'll never be burnt because he will never forsake me. If he hasn't forsaken me when I disregarded him, just like I disregarded my own father, he won't do the same to you. God bless. So um I do have a question. Do you think that your the death of your mother, do you think that it sparked something good in you? in terms of you taking your faith more seriously? No, it wasn't enough. My mom dying wasn't enough for me to take my life seriously. It was enough for me to see, like, life is short. Like, you know, we're all going to die one day. You never know when, you never know who, you never know what's going to happen. What really allowed me to take my life seriously, my spiritual life seriously, relationship with God, was that I started to see myself kind of branch out more on my own. My life, I started to begin to have my own life. And I felt I didn't have that parental guidance anymore like I used to be under my parents' shell anymore. Like I said, I was babied. I was the baby of the family. I always felt like dad and mom could always solve the problem. But 
when I started to get into the real world, I said, God, I need you. And I'm only going to depend on you because if I do this by myself, I'm going to crumble and fall on my face. So lead me and guide me. And I'm, for, ever since that I made that decision, I've been living by faith. Everything that I've received, um, it was by faith, not by my own doing. Of course, I work hard for certain things, but it is by the grace of God that I could say that I've uh, built a more intimate relationship with God uh, because I felt like life was beginning for me. Um, if you want to touch on a lot, you spoke a little bit about um, quite often about you know, you know your near death experience. Um, you know you went through heart surgery and um, just if you want to um, explain. You know, how was that recovery for someone who went through, you know, excessive amount of, you know, sexual immorality, and then you had to deal with the the health of your mother, even though she hasn't passed yet at the time. Um, you literally had a near death experience, like you know, you dropped in the middle of practice, right? So, how was that recovery? You know, um, you know, during surgery, did you have a supernatural experience? Or like even post recovery, you know, the defibrillator, if you want to touch more on that. When I passed out in front of the building, um, it, it's just, it was like everything just went dark. I didn't experience anything, but I know I woke up in the hospital and I was, I was in panic mode. I was scared. I'm like, what's going on? What's going to happen to me? So all these thoughts started to happen. Even after I came out the hospital uh, and I give God all the glory that I even came out the hospital after two days. I still was like, what's going to happen to me? Like, what's next? Like, what's next? I was worried. I was living life. I was, I was walking on eggshells. And at the time, I'm worried because my mom was dealing with cancer and she still had to worry about her baby boy. So that puts a lot of stress on somebody. And we know what stress does to a person's body. You know, it just... It, it just it does more damage. And I was like, I was even mad about that. I'm like, I was mad at the fact that something happened to me that I couldn't control and my mother's worrying about it. So I'm like, man, like, and I'm going to be really honest with you guys that it's, it's probably the most foolish thing, but sometimes I felt like maybe like my mom getting sick, like, you know, I was very rebellious. And I put a lot of stress on my parents. Maybe that something that maybe develop things over time. It's foolish to think about it, like, but, you know, parents, I'm not a parent, but parents worry about a child, and those are the things that were going through my mind. Like, I was worrying too much, and I was stressed, and she was stressed, and I was scared. I was living, I was walking on tiptoes, like, what's gonna happen next? Like, oh my goodness, my mom. I was just scared all the time, scared. Like, I was terrified. I was so scared. The level of like, I was frightened, like, for my life. I was terrified. I didn't know if I go to sleep, I'm, am I going to wake up? But the, 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 the porn thing, it, it, the, 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 the sex thing, all that, those addictions, those things that had a hold on me, it was a battle. It was a fight. There was times I was having dreams, and I was having sex in my dreams. And those things were spiritual. Those things were completely demonic. And, and I would only have those dreams when I would actually physically stop having sex and stop watching porn. But I, know, I, I knew that, okay, I'm having these dreams for a reason. It's because I'm fighting. I'm fighting a serious battle. That's the reason why I'm having these dreams. So it was a battle the whole entire time. It was so hard. When I would see these things in my dreams, it would make me want to desire in real life. It, it, was, just, it was a constant battle, and it was, it was horrible. It was, it was, I, was, I was fighting. It was like playing tug of war. I don't even know how to describe it. Anybody who's going through currently, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And... I was so, like I could say, that just to add to that question, I was just scared and I was just fighting all the time, fighting all the time. And to this day, it's still a fight. But I know that this, by the grace of God and humbly can say that when I let him lead, I let him I live according to his will, he gives me the strength. Um, amen, amen. Um, last question. Um, do you consider yourself a walking testimony and why? I consider myself a walking testimony because there's not one person that I meet, um, whether it be on my, my teammates, whether it be people on the street or whoever, when I talk to, um, 
they they're intrigued by my presence i guess we would say my aura like my personality you know i i don't look like the most uh approachable person but when i actually i'm very kind to people and very talkative and wanted to see how your day is and and, and wanted to talk to you and then a lot of people it brings a lot of interest into who I am, where I came from. And I start to share my t story. And I guess God has given me that gift to where I can impact anybody's life based off my personality, based how how I kind of, um, I'm open to conversation. Somehow I'm able to slip in the gospel a little bit to people um, just based off my own testimony. Hey, I overcame this because Jesus saved me. I am the way I am because um, my identity is in Christ. It, it that in itself is a testimony, and it's it just it's an open conversation to introduce Christ to many people. And I always use myself. That's why I'm not gonna. I'm never gonna be those people who's gonna throw scripture at people and force them to be like, "You need to repent. You need to do this." No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna introduce Jesus in a unique way based off my own life experiences. And that's why I think I'm a walking testimony. Man.